wow, Istanbul, Turkey, this is awesome. So about a year ago, I was hanging out at a bar, having a couple of drinks with my good friend Zhang Li. Zhang Li is a futurist, and he's a really bright guy. He's got all these fancy degrees from Cambridge, MIT, and he got his PhD at USC when I first met him. And now he's working for a think tank. But he's a dear friend and he's somebody who I go to when I personally hit a career wall. So I was telling him what was going on with me. My book had been out for about a year. It's called UX Strategy, as mentioned. It's a book that lays out a groundwork and then has nine tactical techniques that you can use regardless of your work environment for conducting UX strategy. And I'd written it for all kinds of people, not just UX strategists, but engineers, entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, whatever work environment. And this book had become, to my surprise, successful because I think all of a sudden UX has grown up and people are very interested in the ROI of UX design. And so it brought me all over the world, and it's continued to, as we see right now, and I get to meet all these amazing people and learn about their take on software design as I travel. So the book I wrote initially was as a textbook for where I teach. I'm a part-time professor. My, throughout my entire career, over 25 years, I've taught at major universities. And so now I'm at the University of Southern California in the Viterbi Engineering School, not in the Design School, teaching a course called UX Strategy and Design to mostly engineers, some business students, some cinema students, and the class is so popular, luckily, that they gave me two sections because they constantly fill up. And I'm not sure why it's so popular. Maybe it's because people are really interested in the subject matter. Maybe it's because the engineers are sick of taking rote memory and uh, having to write code for their classes. But whatever the reason is, it's an amazing opportunity for me to have every semester 40 really intelligent kids in my class who get to develop a project from the very beginning to the very end throughout the 15 weeks. So I was telling them this, that I was preaching and teaching and traveling the world, but not making. And I felt like a poser because I had no longer been a practitioner. I'd written this book, it took a couple of years, and it's, the key word in there is how to devise innovative products. And I wasn't doing anything. I was just teaching and traveling and doing workshops. So I was asking Zahn, what the hell should I do? I feel kind of stuck. And he said, well, who are the innovators who inspired you? And I said, oh, that's so easy. Andy Warhol. I loved Andy Warhol. Amazing artist. He brought pop culture to the masses and made art accessible to so many people in so many different forms. Made really weird experimental movies that were so disturbing or offensive that people would just walk out of the movie theaters because they would be like eight hours long. He had this factory where he'd bring together all kinds of different artists, all kinds of different people who were just wanting to see what the hell was going on and have bands like the Velvet Underground play. And this was always really inspiring to me. And so then Zahn asked, well, how about somebody in tech? I was like, well, that's easy, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs, incredible, rest in peace. For the last 40 years, him and his company, Apple, 
are responsible for creating the most disruptive innovations that have changed the world, mostly for the better. I mean, my first computers, the SE, you know, he said to his engineers, I want a computer that fits on the yellow pages. In the States, that used to be a book that had all the ads for the stores you can buy things from. And it's this big, and the engineers were like, what, we can't fit it on this. But he said, just do it. He was always just insistent on pushing his, whether it was computers or devices for, regardless of what people said. Even if they said it was impossible, he had his vision. He was an innovator, and he was an inventor, and he worked with amazing inventors, and he put out all these incredible devices that many of us have in our back pocket that we can't stop checking relentlessly for 15 seconds. God forbid we are in the present. But the real takeaway here is that he put all of these technologies together in the form of software like iTunes and the App Store so that we could easily download apps or a single song instead of having to buy a whole stupid record or CD for 15 bucks. And this disrupted the music industry, the film industry, you name it. It changed the way that so much, whether it was media or software design, was going to be created and distributed. And so he really inspired me. And Apple has always been successful because they stay at least two years ahead of the competition. And in hardware, this is absolutely crucial because it takes a long time to catch up. It's a lot faster to catch up with software by knocking, knocking something off. So then Dom said, well, are there any living innovators who inspire you? Perhaps even ones that don't wear black turtlenecks? I was thinking about it. It's like, yeah, I think there's some. <clears throat> Look at this guy. <laughs> Elon Musk is rad. And it's true. I try to dress like my idols who inspire me. Elon Musk, I'm sure you've all heard of him, since he was a teenager, invented so many different things. He created video games, he created web-based phone calls before there was this thing called Skype, he co-founded PayPal where he got the money so he could move into green technologies and alternative energies and do Solar City. He has the coolest electric car out there called the Tesla. And now he's sending rockets into space and he can land them on like a frisbee out in the ocean if he feels like it. Incredible innovator. And Zong's like, well, have you heard about Hyperloop? He just released it. This white paper, he set it out for people to work on as an open source project. And it's, what it's going to do is it's going to allow people to basically get into a pressurized capsule and, and basically move at 720 miles per hour. His ideal was from LA to San Francisco in 30 minutes for 25 bucks. This was his big dream. And he put it out as open source. And the idea with the open source, I like to compare it to skateboarding. It's where people are basically sharing and collaborating on ideas. They see a trick, they're like, that trick's cool, I'm gonna try this. And they mix it up, mash it up, and come up with something better. And so an entire community of, of people can come together and create something massive that's super cool. And at the time, there were two companies in Los Angeles where Elon Musk lives, where I live, who were doing Hyperloop projects. One of them was called Hyperloop Transportation Technologies and the other one Hyperloop One. But the interesting thing about HTT was that they were using crowdsourcing as a business model. 
Now, crowdsourcing is really cool because it's this idea that we can all work on one project. It's almost an extension of open source in a sense, but we're all, all our minds, we can work wherever we are all in the world on different aspects of the products or service or system and collaborate as a community to make something for the common good. And this was run by this guy here named Dirk Alburn. And he was all over the media dropping the term user experience. So I decided I needed to stalk him because I had to get that in, on an innovative product. So I went to LinkedIn and I searched him up and I wrote him my typical, hey, Dirk, want a free copy of my book, UX Strategy? If you give me your mailing address, I'll send it to you. And if you happen to be looking for a UX designer or strategist, I'd love to work with you. 17 seconds later, he writes me back. It's amazing. He says, everybody on the team is working in exchange for stock options. And you get to work 10 hours a week. And just write this guy. I was like, uh, stock options. That's a sort of concept I've been working with for a long time. You know, I owned my own dot-com company in the 90s and paid some of my employees with stock options. I've worked for stock options. They're all monopoly money, most of them. And as my dad says, 10% of nothing equals nothing. And I was like, Dad, this project, I'll get 0.0% of nothing equals nothing. I am going to work on this Hyperloop because I want to work on something innovative that could transform the world and I can have an opportunity to apply my UX strategy methodology. So I had to figure out how to do this because what the hell can we make with 10 hours a week? That's not enough. So I decided I would further crowdsource it to my two new classes that were starting at USC. And I proposed to them, hey guys, sent out a little blackboard notice, that way we communicate with students. Anyone who volunteers for this project can do that instead of their own project, and they just have to go through all the homework assignments. And the only difference between the other students is that we're going to have Skype meetings once a week for an hour. You know, teams of five, four, four to five people, five teams, to work on these different value propositions. 20 people volunteered. So I was off to the races to solve this big picture of transportation. This is Los Angeles on a good day. We sit in our cars, we're stuck. We're not doing anything. We're getting fat because we're not exercising. We're not hanging out with friends. We're not hanging out with our family. We're not productive. We're wasting gas. It's just a mess. I saw lots of traffic here too. So that's just part of the problem, is getting out of the cars. You need to get people out of the cars or do better carpooling, but also make transportation easy for the long haul. And so that's what we set out to do with five different value propositions. And the first one was the passenger app. Now when I teach UX strategy, I never start with a solution. I always start with the problem. We'll mention this. This is a really important concept. And so for us at this project, it was that business commuters and pleasure travelers are challenged to find a cost and time efficient way to travel from point A to point B. And then I have the students create a persona. It's called a provisional persona. It's not those old school personas that have tons of you know, stereotypes and characteristics that are specific to one person and are pretty much meaningless. But by Alan Cooper's third book, he's the dude who invented personas, he created provisional personas. And so that's what I teach. And I then mashed that up with Steve Blank's customer discovery methodology and send the students out to find these people that they hypothesized. So they went to the Santa Monica promenade, found these people, and had to do customer interviews, and either invalidate or validate that there was even a problem. Once they did, and then they 
would look at the value proposition and then do business strategy and look at all the competitors who are offering better, the best solutions out there from traveling from point A to point B, regardless of how many different modes of transportation you're using. And so that's the way all the projects worked. They would do the findings and then they would create a prototype showing how it could have a rapid prototype. We don't do wireframes in my class, there's no time. There's no point. So we want to show these to customers and get feedback. Feedback from customers looking at wireframes is a joke. The second value proposition was a ride sharing app. And so we weren't just thinking about people who were offering services such as Uber drivers that we're used to. We were thinking about tuk-tuks and boats and rickshaws and anybody with some mode of transportation that could get involved and offer it so that we could get from point A to point B faster and that it would all be tied together in a greater system. Again, provisional persona. They used Uber drivers because they're basically trapped in an Uber and they all want a five-star rating. Make sure we got validation on the problem and then do a competitive analysis and then create a rapid prototype that we can then go out and show to potential customers and say, hey, is this something that you would use? This is not user testing. We don't care about usability. I don't know if you've noticed, but the web hasn't changed that much. Apps haven't changed that much in the last certain seven years. And I think it's about time that we focus more on what we're delivering and a little less on like how fast are they clicking through this thing. So we're testing the value proposition. Will people, do people want it? Will people use it? And will people pay for it or opt into our business model, which happened to be advertising? So this was the big concept in terms of how this thing could be sustainable, how it could either be cheap or free for the customers. And so we had to talk to brand strategists or the people that place advertising. And right now, <laughs> they're stuck in terms of they want to do geo-targeted advertising. I had 100% validation talking to these people. And we looked at the competitors, and it's pretty limited. I mean, Facebook is great for doing targeted advertising. And Waze, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's how I get around LA. I can't use Google Maps, it'll chuck me on the freeway, but Waze just gives me the shortcuts. The only problem is I hit a certain intersection and a little ad for like Burger King pops up and I'm like, whoa, crash. You know, it's not ideal. I don't even eat Burger King. So we wanted to come up with something that was far more innovative. And we were looking at ideas like this bike that you can just hop on for free wherever it is and as you spin the wheels, it just blast advertising at people and then the students after they got validation created a prototype on how you would actually go through the process of placing an ad where you could target it at customers at any point along the customer journey and that it would be relevant so if they happen to be going to San Francisco and their favorite band was playing, you could offer them tickets. If they opted into watching a video or a trailer for a movie, then their Uber ride could be free. That way you had an innovative business model tied throughout this entire experience. And so then we had to figure out things at a much higher level and think about people who manage plane systems, trains, buses, you know, I'm working with big data students, so they're not afraid of this stuff. We know that it can be tied together in mind. And so they went out and had to find train managers. And once, this is not, these are not the types of people who are walking down the street. We had to really work hard to find them. And so we used LinkedIn a lot. You'd be surprised how many people are on LinkedIn, offer them an Amazon gift certificate for a 10 minute interview, set up a Skype ask them questions about all the problems that they're having with their systems. Not this, what they imagine the solution to be, but what are the actual problems that they're experiencing? And then at the end, well, if it could be better, what would you envision? 
and validate, like, this is the type of customer segment that we should really focus on. Not a persona, but a segment so we could build a direct channel to them. Do a competitive analysis, of course, find out that all these legacy systems are outdated, and then create a prototype. And that's the way my class works. And that's how I practice my methodology. <coughs> and you can practice these things in order. This is for onboard entertainment, which we all know is pretty limited. And you get on a plane. But we knew with Hyperloop, people would be bolted in. They couldn't get up to get their laptop. So we wanted to build something into the back of the seat where you could just click the button and all of a sudden just access your computer and everything would be there and you could type and you could uh, do email or do anything you want without actually having to pull out a laptop. That was what we envisioned. And so this was a lot of fun and a great experience to really tie a bunch of different ideas that were futuristic together in one place and create a new system. So these are the takeaways. The first thing is no matter where you are in your career path, you should always have mentors and inspiring heroes to keep you motivated. The second thing is that if you wanna work on innovative concepts or projects, you need to position yourself as a contributor. It's not about the money. And then lastly, by applying a UX strategy methodology to futuristic concepts, even engineering students can attempt to transform the world for the common good. Thank you.